My name is Kate Coleman. I am a lecturer here in art and design teacher education. My research is in digital and visual methods and methodologies, particularly around the use of digital pedagogies, um, digital portfolios and digital methods for learning and teaching. I support teachers to develop their own voice and agency and leadership through digital and visual methods. And I'm really interested in how we can use methods such as these uh, to enhance our student experience um, within the school space. So I want to first acknowledge the country that we meet on today. Um, these are the lands of the Wurundjeri people who have been custodians for this land and of this land for thousands of years. And I acknowledge and pay my respects to elders past and present. I acknowledge that they have been custodians for many centuries and continue to perform age old ceremonies of celebration, initiation and renewal. And one that I add, which is a really important one to me around storytelling. And so what do digital and visual methods enable us to continue in terms of performing ceremonies of learning and teaching are something that I'm really interested in. So I'm going to deal with this a little bit like a book to load up the front matter, have some um, ideas around methods and learning and teaching, particularly around personal learning environments, um, and then have the back matter and return to my ideas and what I was thinking about when I conceived of this presentation. So this video lecture is gonna explore the potential of these methods, potential of these me methods to encourage discussion collaboration, reflection, creation and curation. These are the aspects of my research that I have been most interested in and the ones that I work with my teachers on here in initial teacher education, ones that I use in professional learning communities with teachers and also ones that I then use with students in schools. Um, and I really see that digital and visual methods inside and outside of the classroom enable learners to build their agency, to use their agency in multiple sites, um, S-I-T-E-S and S-I-G-H-T-S, but they also give them a chance to be heard in multiple spaces or sites to develop a range of multimodal literacies and skills that they need now, but will need for an unknown future. Not an unknown future in, in a kind of apocalyptic term, but an unknown future for their own futures. What lifelong and life-wide learning will mean for them means that they need a range of literacies, capacities and skills to engage in any space or site or part of the world that they want to engage in. So here's my brain dump and I wanted to use a bit of digital and visual method work um, to show you some of the ways that I work collaboratively with students and with teachers to develop this kind of collaborative digital voice. So often in a collaborative tool, I throw down a bunch of ideas and work with teams of students to develop these in collaborative spaces. So um, using these in a Google Doc, for instance, or a um, Microsoft space, whatever tool I've got that is going to enable me to work in and out of voices. Um, so here's my brain dump not done collaboratively, but done in a collaborative tool. Creative methods use diverse tools. And it's one thing I'm really interested in around these kind of methods for learning. And they embody experiences for partners in learning, how we co-design, co-partner, co-write, co-work, and how I like to talk about collaboration and co-laboring. How do we co-labor as learners, um, both teachers and students? What do the visual digital humanities look like for us? I think are a really important part of my research and something that I work on here at the university, but something that I'm keen to think about in school-based settings, how we both consume and produce material, how we produce pictorial and spatial rather than textual um, and information laden um, STEM and HASS inquiries that seem to be really text heavy. What does it look like to actually produce something visual and digital for a range of audiences using multimodal tools? And I, I'm not going to use that word tool very often because I think that a tool is an enabler, but it's an, only an enabler when it's actually established and built in 
to the pedagogy and built into the practice for everyone involved in the space. So voice and choice are some of these words in this kind of environment that get thrown around a little bit. Um, but that popular term actually needs us to do something with it. Voice and choice advocates say they want more freedom for students to select a path. But what are they doing with it is the thing that I ask my teachers, either in professional learning or my teachers becoming teachers, to consider. What are you doing with that voice? What are you doing with those choices? And why I prefer to talk about voice and agency and leadership. Because agency is the freedom to choose what we want and how we want to learn it. Um, and curriculum matters, but I think that practice matters inside that as well. And so how do we work out how to integrate and intertwine those things so that we get the best out of an inquiry with students as co-laborers, as co-designers and co-thinkers and co-learners? So can we reimagine the classroom? Can we reimagine the classroom as a blended and authentic learning environment? And what might that actually look like? What does the real world of using visual and digital methods enable? And I come back to David Bowd's 2000 statement around assessment that really drives my principles. Assessment that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of students to meet their own future learning needs is something that David um, has instilled in me as a researcher around assessment as learning but particularly in my focus in digital and visual methods for learning and teaching because as David continues assessment for longer term learning is something that we need to think about. So, and this is why I don't think these are tools. Tools have the implication that I do something fun um, and sexy with a piece of learning and that it doesn't have implications wider than that. And that's not what I'm interested in. I want these to think about um, their integration into the self, integration into the self as learner over time. So the other thing that I'm really interested in is selfies, looping media, infographics, memes and online videos. These are some of the things that I think um, at least with my initial teachers, I'm getting them to think really broadly and widely around, around how we teach literacy and numeracy using the skills and capacities of things that we see around us in our visual and digital culture. How do we invite the things that are a part of this visual culture into the classroom and enable some learning um, through them? How do I do that as a teacher and how do I ask my students to do that with me as learners? Um, and then my kind of last brain dump on what I was thinking about when I designed this was the importance of visual elements um, to digital, social and mobile media within everyday life. How do I ask somebody to build their digital literacies? How do I scaffold them and how do I model them? It means that I need to be doing this myself. I need to be engaging with digital and visual methods as an educator so that I can do this with my students. So my provocation question to you as we um, kick this off, in what ways do you already do this? In what ways do you encourage student voice, agency and leadership in your school setting? And then the addition to that is, how do you do it through digital and visual methods in the classroom to enhance student learning? If you're not doing it now, how might you think about doing it? So, last bit of front matter. This is the kind of me lo loading us up on the ways that I'm going to explore different ideas in this. What are the digital and visual methods in personalised learning strategies? So for me, it's the first thing is about digital citizenship. How do I ask and model and scaffold people to work with me as digital citizens? How do they actually engage with digital citizenry? How do we think about the world and how are we given the voice an agency to comment as a part of that world. How do we design for seamless learning in a blended environment where the physical space and the digital space and the virtual space and then the technical space uh, and then the disciplinary space need to actually integrate and work with each other? How do we design for learner engagement using digital and visual methods? Uh, one thing I'm really interested in is this concept of learning oriented assessment. So David Bowd talks about sustainable assessment and these are the things that have driven me in my design of assessment that is lifelong. It actually gives the skills and capabilities of the field but enables me to learn over time. 
And then this um, big idea of lifelong and life-wide learning, which to me is about authentic learning. It's about real world learning. And that doesn't mean that it's in situ. It doesn't mean that I need guest speakers. It means that it has sustainability into the lifelong and life-wide learning of that person. How do I build the capabilities and capacities to be a lifelong and life-wide learner? We're already lifelong. We're born into lifelong learning. But how does it actually impact across my life? And then into desire paths. How do I use inquiry-based learning, for instance? How do I use technology and visual methods to enable students to follow pathways of learning that they're interested in? So this comes from work by Professor Mike Keppel that I've been interested in for some time around how we design personalised learning strategies um, and, and his kind of future ideas of what learning and teaching in the next generation of learning spaces might look like. So last bit of front matter. What does this look like? So here's a quick example of digital and visual methods for learning. This is um, an amazing visual and digital um, practitioner whose name is Brian Mathers. He uh, works out of the UK. Um, and he, like I've started with in my front matter, talks about sight a lot. Um, insight, insight and insight. How do we sight? How do we CITE? How do we sit as researchers and practitioners and how do we teach that kind of method work over time? How do we um, insightfully design and visualise ideas and information? And how do, we, um, how do we then think about them inside the personalised learning environment? So visual thinkery is one of the spaces that I'm going to come back to. But in terms of the digital and the visual, I'm going to split them every now and again and then I'm going to bring them back together. This one brings them together because this is using digital sketches. So drawing and listening using iPad um, writing and drawing tools. Um, things like uh, Paper 53, which um, Brian uses a lot, a really lovely app um, to design sketchbooks in um, iPads. So he takes that kind of dialogue, the conversation, that's done online or face-to-face -face in a kind of interview or response while you sit and listen. So you could be doing the same thing right now. Turns them into sketches and then turns them into artworks and then wraps text around them. So kind of reflective prompts. Um, and to me, that is a method work. It's not about using the tool to get something done and ticking a box that yes, I've integrated ICT because it's something that I'm really not interested in doing. And so I'm interested in building capacities and these digital and visual methods for me are the kinds of lifelong and life-wide skills that I believe we will need into the future. So here we go, in my middle matter. How can we enhance participatory opportunities for student voice agency and leadership? So one of the um, documents that I really like to refer to a lot is this continuum of practice um, that is in the Amplify project by the Department of Education and Training. Um, it locates what student voice is, what student agency is, and what student leadership is. So I've just drawn this kind of quick diagram for you in thinking about what sits in the middle. How do I actually, um, how do I do this? What are the um, practices? What are the pedagogies? And what are the policies that are sitting around me that might support that? And those three Ps are really important for me when I work with educators, um, and then when I'm working with students thinking about practices, what are the practices in my discipline? What are the practices as an interdisciplinarian? What are the practices of me being multi and transdisciplinary, for instance? And those practices sit in the middle. So I'm going to work my way through voice, agency and leadership, but I'm very specific to this digital and um, visual method space. So one of the things that I think about um, in terms of this work is how we contribute to the culture. How does voice agency and leadership help to um, shift what a practice might look like? So I guess I'm asking you not to just be a passive listener in this, but to think visually and digitally as we go. So think about a learning space that makes you feel safe. Is it culturally safe? Do I feel safe to get something wrong because I think that risk and failure are a really important part of this. 
they're a part of my training as an artist and designer, but I think they probably need to be a part of more of our pedagogy so that we can feel like we can get something wrong and that that failure is a part of an iterative um, learning process. So what does that learning space look like? So if you think about the characteristics of that learning environment, what are they? Is it a physical space? Is it the way that uh, the space makes you feel? Is it the affect? Is it what comes out of it or spills out of it or opens up? I really like to use lists and I think that digital and visual methods enable us to use lists really well. Kathleen Stewart is one of my um, methodological practitioners that I go to a lot of kind of guru in list making um, and uses lists of up to 100 or 200. Uh, and these are really good provocations for students to do digitally or to draw them. Um, or, or to do that together. And again, as I said at the start, I'm going to split digital and visual every now and again and then bring them to digital and visual. Um, so you can be doing that in either way right now. But what are the characteristics of that safe learning space? And then if you think about what makes it unsafe, what makes you not included? What makes it, an, um, what makes it a space that's not inclusive for you as a learner? And then list five to 10 characteristics of that learning environment. What are the unsafe or the non-inclusive parts? I think these are really important things to kickstart us and for you to engage with what I would like us to think through together um, in how we can design our classrooms to contribute to the, a culture of agency, a culture of voice and a culture of leadership using methods such as these. So what can we do? with and through digital visual methods. So I'm saying everything from ideation to implementation is an important part of process and product work. So what does Instagram look like in my classroom, for instance? How can I do digital storytelling with an, with an app like that, that I, as a teacher, start to possibly share in a portfolio opportunity for my parents, for my school communities, for my communities of practices, for my international associations. There's some really great examples of teachers using class Instagram blogs where they um, film and photograph the process and product of learning over time. And these are then used as prompts and provocations back to students to write about and use in digital, story techniques, digital storytelling techniques. What does it look like to use GIFs or GIFs however you want to pronounce it. I kind of alternate between um, GIFs and GIFs every now and again, depending on what I'm thinking through. But these are really great um, opportunities for student voice and agency in a classroom. When you ask in either in a flipped environment, send out a, a provocation for homework to bring back the next day or to post online, how you're feeling at certain times. How can these kind of technologies that seem such a part of everyday life become a part of our learning environments. You know, I can, um, in Facebook Messenger, open up what a GIF to send to somebody about how I'm feeling. And I have a bunch of friends who we just send these to um, back and forward without any, any words around them. But the, these are something that I've been using in professional learning spaces before people come into the um, professional learning space. How do you feel about today? And using these as a provocation to discussion around the community of practice and its shared sense of beliefs um, has become a practice that I've fallen um, in love with and I think that we could use a lot in the classroom as a way of giving feedback. How do you feel about this assessment task? Send me um, a GIF in response. And that kind of feedback to us gives the voice to students to use tools that, that are ubiquitous, a part of life, um, to share in dialogue with us. What does Lego series play look like in our classroom? Um, again, a tool that I use in professional learning with teachers where I can use this in kind of met metaphoric play. Um, Lego series play, you can just Google online and have a look at the whole process of what that means. Um, so instead of drawing metaphors or, um, you know, and visually thinking about metaphors for learning, how can I use this physical play using Lego um, to do this metaphoric work? 
and then do individual work or collaborative work and then switch back into doing an inquiry, for instance. How can I use these methods of design thinking to enable this, where I work through these processes of ideation um, and, and uh, prototyping into big design work, where I'm actually testing an experience inside an inquiry? What do GoPros look like in my room? Um, either a GoPro worn on a chest vest, GoPros on our desks, to actually use video and film methods of data collecting. And I'm not talking about data in terms of research outside uh, or action research inside the classroom. I'm thinking about what it means to talk about method work with students as researchers, that we are lifelong and life-wide researchers together. And so how can I use the tools of research inside the classroom to, to learn and to give feedback and evaluate? And then some other things like Padlet and FreeMind I'm going to go into, Simple Minds, which is a really beautiful tool for giving um, feedback through reflection. So where are my students at? Let's look at these concept ma maps together. Let's do some peer and self review of these concept maps so that I'm doing preparation work and reflection work before I move on through my content. And I use Padlet um, in that sense rather than Padlet as a portfolio here. Um, but then up in this little iPad on the side, what does Padlet and Google Drive and OneDrive enable me to do this collaborative ideation and implementation work together where I can have a group of people using Padlet as a shared um, space for idea making where I'm collecting and sourcing things and curating things from all over the place and together as a collective voice using this to write, to create and to curate and using Google Drive and OneDrive the same way. Now, this is kind of tool driven, but these tools need to be enacted methodologically. They need to come as methods into our classroom to engage with pedagogies. So how can we use multimedia artifacts to do that? I'm gonna run through types and ways of doing things. So digital and visual tools are, are a part of a learning space and curriculum design. Uh, and they need to be built in carefully. They need to be, I think in my experience, they need to be backward designed off what it is that you want to achieve and how can I use different methods to help me get there. I do not see these, and I feel like I'm on a bit of a rant about this, but they're not plug-in things. They're not go away and do this on your own. They, these need to be established and modelled and scaffolded together collaboratively so that we can learn and engage with skills um, and capacities that we need for life-wide learning. So multimedia artifacts include um, text. So how do we use text in a collaborative digital and visual sense? So what does it mean to be using if you're a Google school in your drive? If you're a Microsoft school, what does it look like if I'm in um, my Word shared space? Um, drawings digital drawings using applications, drawings on paper, digitizing them to curate them and collect them for later. What does it mean to use audio in a classroom as a multimedia artifact? Uh, and artifacts of learning is, is how I'm using that term artifact. So what is an audio file and how might I actually use it to get feedback from students? How can I use it in my own agency and leadership to give feedback to students? Um, and how might we actually use it to disseminate information to a community of practice? How do I use images, photographs, um, other artworks such as Google Art and Culture, which is an amazing um, project by Google that's about 10 years old that enables me to walk through galleries, to walk through museums and use all of its digital content in my, in my learning experience. What does it mean to invite animation into the product of an inquiry? How can I share what I know in a different way, using a range of different um, multimodal experiences? How do I use video? And then what does interactive content mean? C can I do something that enables me to shift um, the practice over time by having a range of different um, tools, a range of different interactions within those tools and those processes and products? So some of the things that this enables is our capacities to identify, to access, manage, integrate, evaluate. These are all digital literacies. 
sometimes wrapped up in information literacy, in media literacy, but I like to think about digital and visual methods as literacies. These are multi-dimensional. They ask us to um, transmediate, to go from one mode to use um, reflection and metacognitive actions to then transmediate into another um, mode. Um, and that means that I need to be thinking about this ideation to implementation process where I don't just do one thing and then create another thing. I might actually work through a process of transmediation to, to finalise the final product for submission. These big ideas support the development of construction of new knowledge through partnerships that I am co-learning. I am co-labouring with my colleagues and I learn to collaborate and cooperate through digital and visual communication tools. They build my communication skills and, and capabilities. They build my digital citizenship, my digital literacies, um, my social emotional learning, my ability to self-regulate while I'm working with people um, and a bunch um, of other skills in here that I won't touch on because it's not the purpose of this lecture today. But I think it's really important to consider the role of social and emotional learning in this kind of capacity and capability and li literacy framework. How do I build an understanding of digital identities if I'm not working in digital spaces? And how do I do feedback on and for learning through shared decision making? So some quick tools that already exist. You know, this um, one here with the Bloom's wheel and um, ways of thinking about Bloom's and tools. So what are those tools? They're all just a bunch of apps. You can, you know, look at how I'm designing for learning. Um, and the other one, the Bloom's taxonomy of verbs from um, lower order thinking to higher order thinking and ways of integrating these two together. I really like these two um, frameworks together as um, firstly the taxonomy, but it's kind of built up into a conceptual framework to think about how these might layer. So what are, what are my lower order thinking strategies and what are my higher order thinking strategies and how do I use the digital and, and visual methods to enable these so that by the end I'm doing these big um, design bits of work around video blogging, for instance, but I need to build up my um, knowledge and understanding to apply that um, and then to analyse and evaluate before I'm doing my um, bigger maybe transmediation work. So some multimedia tools and I said I'm going to talk about tools and then I'm going to try and load, load them into things. So these are all of the things that I'm in love with at the moment in building digital and visual methods because they're doing the two together. Um, I'm working digitally but I'm also working visually. So I'm thinking about how each of these spaces enable me to do higher order thinking to actually ask our students to curate and, and create new knowledge based on their experiences, based on um, interventions of content, provocations of content, um, and integrative ways of demonstrating knowledge. So a bunch of things that I've been using a lot um, with teachers and with students. So Story Wars, for instance, is this really great read, write, and vote on collaborative storytelling. So you're working digitally, but you're also working visually in terms of sight. And this is the one thing that I, um, SIGHT, thinking about the ways that we engage with digital content, because it's quite different from actually passively um, participating in watching a digital presentation than sitting with a computer or an iPad in front of me and actually engaging with it visually. Explain everything I've been using as a teacher for a long time, but how do we actually do this in a, with students? So explain everything is a whiteboard to actually explain hard to explain concepts, um, threshold concepts, for instance. And so how do I use multimedia tools to actually um, explore ways using animation, using um, 4D tools and three-dimensional building um, to explain hard to, hard to explain, hard to write, how to draw concepts. Um, Teacher agency and student agency can be built in a tool like that, for instance. Um, 
Yo Teach is a back channel, a really great way of enabling digital and visual methods for students to give evaluation back to teachers. Um, you know, how something is going at particular times. And I, I don't, again, I'm not seeing these as plug-in votes. This is about constant engaging, engagement in building the digital literacies around what back channel tools enable how we're going to engage as adults in a, in a world that where interactive polls and messages are, co are continuously sent to us. How can I build the literacies and capacities inside my learning environment using tools such as these? Um, Microsoft Teams or Google Drive are dependent on your school but are both accessible. These need digital literacies around them. I need to have a digital identity, understanding I need to, within that, understand my digital footprint. And so these need to be, for me, in multimodal spaces built up over time, maybe using some of the smaller places so that I can start to think about what data management looks like um, in terms of using Drive or Teams because data can be used in multiple places by multiple people depending on who I've, who I've shared it with. These are really important capacities and life-wide skills for what our unknown future might look like that I need to build up over time. And if we're not doing it at school, where are they learning it is something that I'm, um, you know, continuously reinforcing with my becoming teachers. Um, Spiral is another multimedia assessment space that I love. These are all free tools. Um, I think that these are important ones to consider not because um, they're not going to cost the school money because, you know, I think that that, is an important part of curriculum and learning design, but because these are accessible beyond the classroom, they do have their own digital literacies and capacities built within them as well. Who do I, what tools do I use and what data is owned by companies? These are big ideas to, to talk about with students. Where is their content? You know, have we talked about where their learning is and how I'm using it and how other people might be using it? Have we talked about um, big companies and how big companies have data around us? Have we talked about surveillance cameras, for instance, you know, that when we walk into Westfield, we're all being monitored and there's data being collected on us. These are big ideas around the sustainable ideas and practices of being in a digital world. And to me, visual and digital methods um, enable the building of those. So some ways that I do this in the classroom and some ways that I do this in the classroom with teachers or in professional learning um, to build up in terms of that taxonomy, voice, agency and leadership um, over time. So the first thing I do is to actually think about what a zine is. And th this is a way of kind of splitting the two. So I've got visual and I've got digital. Um, a zine is a really great method for doing visual work, for um, doing explorations of inquiries and product sharing, dissemination of information from a research assignment, because a zine is a lo-fi way of sharing information. And they are photocopyable because you're either working off an A4 for a little tiny zine or an A3 for an A5 zine um, because the paper folds into eight distinct um, pieces in a little magazine and these can be shared in the library space so that um, the research assignments and inquiries become public disseminated pieces of information. Um, so ones here on equal rights, um, students thinking about the things that they love in anime for instance or um, doing science um, and sustainability um, inquiries. So the link there to the conversation is just a great little article about why zines matter and what they can do for learning and the one at the bottom actually um, you can just go to test.com forward slash lessons I think and probably just google that but it will give you a really great um, little template to think about how you fold things um, but we have Sticky Institute here in Melbourne if you're located here um, which is at Flinders Street which is a zine store you can go in and see them but you can Google ways that zines become a part of libraries and how students start to see themselves as researchers and, and visualizing their research for others. How do we share our knowledge in visual ways? The other side is some ways of thinking about doing, for me, the same thing, but digitally. Using SimpleMind, which is an EU tool, using Coggle or FreeMind or using Padlet 
to start to do this concept mapping and sharing so that I'm not just doing concept maps for me in a kind of connective relational brain dump, but how I might share information with others using tools like this. And then how do I collaborate with others? And then how do I present these? So do I have a digital screen up in the school where people are able to see the relational connections that students are making between big ideas? Um, and can other people connect to them? So I might print them and, and visually in the school enable kind of string and pin contents. So you might be able to put up post-it notes and engage with this visually on your own so that the research that sometimes is in internal and internal to a classroom becomes public. And to me, that's what digital and visual methods enable. So how might we do this with voice? Um, podcasting to me is one of the um, literacies that I think that many of us um, probably engage with in our leisure time. If you're a train or tram catcher, um, for flights, you know, this is, this is how I kind of pass my time listening to my podcasts that I collect up. But these are all the literacies that these contain, this information literacy, storytelling skills. How do I take my research around my inquiry, for instance, and be able to tell a story around it? Can I interview people um, and create um, a podcast? Can I do a really great um, multimedia assignment where I'm interviewing, if I'm looking in the history or social science and go and do interviews and and put a podcast together and then have a channel at the school to share with everybody else what I've been learning about. Auditory skills and communication skills, my oral fluency and my media literacy, um, as well as presentation and speaking skills. So some ways to do this. So Audacity, GarageBand and VoiceThread are tools that I might build into my pedagogy um, and ways that I might think about practicing a weekly classroom news broadcast. How can we ask students to develop a broadcast on what's happened the week before in an evaluation or feedback mechanism and broadcast um, and everyone gets to listen to them uh, either before they come to class, within the class or post class? Can I document an incursion or excursion using a podcast? And if I have a channel in my classroom, then be able to um, share them all or they be presented um, in a student portfolio. Can I record a class discussion? Can I actually just within the room that I'm in, in again, thinking about personalized learning spaces, how I might have little group work happening over time and I'm having those discussions recorded and then the students might be able to take those recordings and instead of visually or textually um, recording them on post-it notes, they might be just being able to listen to it and then hear back using VoiceThread what they were talking about to then synthesize and consolidate that information? Can I conduct some interviews and can I review curricular content, which I think is a really interesting way for students to use their voice and agency and leadership to talk back to what it is that they're learning, to explore the curriculum together and to review that content and to share that um, with other students through podcasts that might be presented. Um, and then for us to think about how we might invite podcasts in. So Mrs. Patel is like the top podcast for um, upper primary, secondary students internationally at the moment. How Stuff Works is always in the top 10 of podcasts. Um, and there's this great link in that tiny URL, which is the 10 podcasts for teens, things that they actually want to listen to that, um, and stuff you should know is sitting inside. It's also one of my favorite podcasts um, and a way of me thinking about learning beyond the classroom into the um, life-wide and lifelong space. So how might we use digital tools um, in terms of video to actually um, enhance our voice agency and leadership? So some ways that we might be able to enhance learning is to think about experiments or experimental situations and how can I film them on a GoPro? How might I use um, iPhones or um, iPads to film experiential learning? Um, how can I illustrate abstract principles, say by using um, clay models and actually making short little films? Can I think about three-dimensional space um, and spatial pedagogies using film? To, um, to possibly do a role play or a, a case study scenario? Can I use animation and slow motion or sped up video to demonstrate changes over time? So something that I might be doing as an experiment in a classroom. Can I be drawing, literally holding 
a phone above building a little contraption where I'm doing visual methods for explanation and exploration and I'm filming them as I go. Um, and these practical activities, filming out on the sporting field um, and being able to watch something back uh, and then synthesizing and summarizing and condensing information. So some other ways for us to look at that and then to engage with that is to have a think about um, the opportunities that already exist. So my student film festival, my state student film festival exists for us across the country. Um, the Adam Awards um, that are open for student films, the one minute film competition, one minute films or one minute papers or one minute essays are really great little ways to do digital and visual methods for feedback to you, evaluation to you, but also um, as students being able to share information. So changes across a school, um, demonstrating student leadership, a one minute film on things they might like to see in the environment, for instance. The Resource Smart Schools Award exists. Um, the Flickr Fest is a great one, um, short film festival held um, in Bondi each year. Um, but just to think about small changes you can make in a classroom to experiment with multimedia artifacts like text and audio and animation, diary narrative, short videos, what these actually look like for engagement in learning. So to top this off, where does all this stuff go? Um, my research in e-portfolios and digital portfolios for voice agency and leadership is um, long term. I've been doing this about 10 years. As an artist, I have always had a portfolio and I became really interested in where all the artifacts go. In early childhood, portfolios are a really important part of learning and so they became relevant to me when my children were young. And then I realized, well, where is all the rest of this stuff? I'm a secondary teacher and I've got kids producing some of the most amazing bits of work, some things that they might never produce again in their lifetime but it's not going anywhere. It's either going in a bin, if it's digital, it might just be on a flash drive somewhere, if we're lucky, um, or it might be somewhere lost in the cloud. So how can I use portfolios to enhance um, my voice, my agency and my leadership by curating that content, telling a digital story about who I am by assembling all of these artifacts. So I like to, talk about portfolios with students as wunderkammers, this kind of collection or curation or exhibition of things that we might have on a, a shelf. And so using um, physical space and placemaking tools to think about what it looks like inside. These are, I have found the best way with students to explore digital literacies because digital portfolios and the design and creation and curation of them teach me all of the skills that I actually need to engage in the bigger, wider digital world, because I start to see that the owner of the site is responsible for the pathway of the reader. So I'm creating digital spaces that no one can really see except for me. I'm curating how people move through the space. So just like I would in a physical exhibition where I might read the text and then see an artwork and then see a sculpture and then watch a video, I have to do the same thing in a digital space. So I have to learn a range of communication skills to do this thinking. And then the reflection on those so that the narrative works for other people to read means that these are really important metacognitive tools um, for thinking about thinking and seeing that thinking in action, which to me is a really important um, component. So here's some ways of doing portfolios. Seesaw is a really well-known um, portfolio tool across most of the world at the moment, um, inside um, primary, middle schools, secondary schools, um, using Edmodo, which is a really great learning management system I've done. I did a really great project, international project in a high school, where a high school in Sydney and a high school in Denver, Colorado, used Edmodo as a learning platform and a portfolio to share work, to collaborate, to talk synchronously and asynchronously and produce a range of shared visual material to share back out into their school communities. Bulb, Pebble Pad, um, these are all kind of spaces that some of you might be thinking about or already using, but maybe not using as a portfolio. Pebble Pad, um, for instance, can be used um, at large scale and in, inside a school. Um, but Padlet is a really great little portfolio for people to think about ways of doing visual and digital methods um, collaboratively and independently.
And then your Google suite, even if you're not a Google school, Google has all the opportunities to curate um, content, even just use slides, for instance, in a PowerPoint. How do I tell a story of all the things I've already done? Wrap the artifacts together to produce a new story for different people. So e-portfolios um, are about showcasing learning. They're around self-assessment and self-reflection, but they're also around thinking about um, a process of learning over time. And these are, um, for me, the important parts of digital and visual methods, because where else does the work go um, if I'm not curating it into a space to then share and empower students' voice and agency? So they're a method of self-discovery and conf confidence building, but they're also about building our personal and our academic identities. What does it mean to be a learner? And what is my learner identity? Um, digital and visual methods bring this to the forefront because I have to be thinking about who I am in the, in the outside world and, who, and how I'm representing myself, how I'm um, presenting myself. Um, they invite teacher feedback, evaluation and peer review because I can see the learning over time. Do I ask my students to curate their multimodal artifacts every six months and to share a new narrative? Do these portfolios push out to parents? Do I put them on the school website? Do I um, publish them in, on TV screens around my school, for instance, so that people can engage in what's going on inside um, the learners in the classrooms. And the last one that I'm going to um, think about, and really this is the end of our kind of taxonomy, is how I recognise some of these um, ways of enhancing voice agency and leadership. So open digital badges are a way to warrant and recognise skills, experience and knowledges. Um, they are able to certify and warrant for both the earner, the learner, but for other um, digital spaces as well. So these are some spaces where we can design these. If you're in a Canvas school, um, you might already have Badger and be thinking about how Badgers recognize and verify um, skills. Because if we think about what the skills are that we've been building up over time, and I've been thinking about with you, there's inherent skills inside each of these knowledges. And how do we recognize those in a mark on something? Because the mark is only indicative of a final product, but what happens in terms of the process? And that mark, for instance, might only be indicative of what you know in relation to um, something else. And so if you get 75, but you've actually got this amazing depth of experience in developing film, how, can, how might I be able to recognize some of the micro skills within that? Um, and these are some ways that I've been designing um, with schools and designing with students so that they are able to demonstrate their leadership as stakeholders within the school to talk about ways of recognizing and verifying knowledge. So it's an old concept. If you were a scout or a girl guide or a brownie, you know how hard it is to get these warranted um, recognition. Um, skills, you have to be able to um, design the skill and then you have to go and get it verified by somebody and then you take that back to the next person to verify. Um, so this is now just done digitally. They're digital and visual tools that enable us to have a kind of like that beautiful t um, drawing at the top and this is by um, Brian Mathers who we started with. Um, it's an audit trail so it can sit on top of things. If I'm really great at film um, how do I recognize that film? Because the, the rubric and assessment may not have been the skills wrapped up in the filmmaking, um, but I might want to recognize that. It engages the often disengaged learner because the mark might not be the thing that they're after. They're building up skills over time and, and there's no other way to warrant them or recognize them. Um, so let's go into my back matter and pull this all together and, and see how I started. And hopefully you've traveled with me through to pull it back at the end. So I was wanting to think about how these me methods are diverse, but they embody an experience and, and to partner as learners. For me as a teacher to be a partner and co-laborer in the learning environment. For me to step out of different roles when I need to, to be facilitator, to be teacher, to be educator, 
to be um, leader in the integration, all kinds of roles that I need to move in in personalised learning environments. Um, and using tools like this means that I need to be able to shift because I need to be able to think about ways that these are integrated to, um, to build up capacities, not for a skill to be learnt, um, explored and then moved on from. These are things that need to be built up over time because it's about consuming and producing. Um, it's about uh, students having freedom to think about the path that they want so that they've got all of these tools in their little toolbox and they can, in the inquiry, choose a mode that actually suits the outcome. But that means they need to have been taught these over time because they need to be modelled and scaffolded so that they have that choice um, to think about the mode that they present their um, research and inquiry in. Um, that we reimagine the classroom to do this because to do podcasting, to do filmmaking, um, to do uh, in, in the invitation of drawing for, on iPads, for instance, means I need to think differently about my, the way that my learning environment works. And it needs to be authentic in that it represents those worlds that that thinking exists in. Um, and I need to then be able to think about ways of assessing for longer term learning. So I tried to pull together some ideas around how we build the capacities um, and the learning strategies for my students being digital citizens with me, that I am modelling that and scaffolding that and we are um, partnering in this digital citizenship to, to do exploratory work, to present work, to share work, that my learning environment becomes seamless where the digital and the physical becomes a part of situated learning, that I don't have to go to a lab to do computer learning, that I actually integrate digital differently and that means that the digital world becomes a part of the physical world. And then I'm not focusing on tools or technologies, but I'm thinking about what it means to be digital. I'm thinking about how I engage my learners in owning what they do, in owning the modes that they might like to present in, in having the skills and capacities to present in those multi-modes. And that that assessment is then um, learner-oriented and learning-oriented through those multi-modes, that they are indicative of the learning you know, doing a video-based um, assessment has got to be visual and people have to see it. Or why am I making a video? And that learning-oriented assessment is a part of um, that learning design for me. That these skills are lifelong and life-wide. They enable me to move beyond the classroom to do the transference and the transformation. For me to think about my physical, um, informal learning life away from school and how it integrates with my school-based learning. Um, to, to create paths of learning for myself that bring um, my voice and my agency and my leadership through different um, modalities together um, to be able to explore different ideas that I have around um, presenting the research that I am participating in. So thanks for being with me on this. This is uh, one of the zines um, that one of my initial teacher educators made when they came back from placement. Um, and these pedagogies are an important part of building teacher capacity for me. And so they engage with all of these themselves and then they're able to take these methods back to school. And I really look forward to you doing that too. My email is there if you want to send me some of the products that you've designed with your students, if you want to ask me some questions around what learning design might look like to do a seamless learning environment. I'm very happy for you to be in contact with me. Thanks very much.